I'm ready to I'm ready to preach today, okay? I'm ready. We're continuing this series. We're continuing this series when culture shifts. If you like opening your Bibles, we're going to be in Daniel 1. If not the uh, the the scriptures will always like always they'll be behind me. Um, last week was so I, I just really felt God on me last week. If you missed last week, last week was part one of this series. If you missed it, you can catch it on YouTube, Facebook. If you haven't uh, subscribed to our YouTube channel, do so, Crossroads Worship Center. There's a few of them. You just got to find. I got to be careful with the Siri thing. I'm telling you, I started texting people when I was preaching one day. I don't know what's going on here. Hold on. Let's keep that over. Be, behave yourself. And you guys get that? The, the iPhone, you start talking, all of a sudden Siri starts texting somebody. I was texting a pastor friend a couple months ago, when I, or I, I don't know how long ago, when I was preaching. And he's in Indiana answering me while he's preaching. It was funny, funny story. But uh, anyways, as I'm getting into this series, um, our culture, many of you know, I kind of laid out and, and, and highlighted specifics last week. I'm not going to go into all the specifics again, but how many of you know that our culture is sliding away from God in a rapid way? Like, I mean, it is, it's actually in a rapid pace. It's actually amazing, actually, how fast it's happening. We've seen it. It's been going on for decades, but it seems like everything's been in overdrive over the last few years. Am I preaching to anybody? Give me some amens. Give me, a, give me a shout just so I know I'm not talking to myself up here. But we have been serious, uh, experiencing a culture that's falling away from God's ways. Um, in our country, in our world, it's just happening more and more. We're seeing the God of this age. The Bible describes the God of this age as Satan blinding the eyes of the unbelievers that they can't see the light of the gospel. And we're seeing that culture, um, we're seeing the increase of his, the increasing of his agenda, agenda in the schools, in government, and in every area of life. We're seeing it more and more. Told you last week, that's why I stopped watching the news, because I'm just like, what is going on? And I just wanted to guard my heart and stop watching it, not to be uninformed, if, hey, if something major is happening, I'm going to find out about it. But we're seeing it. Uh, um, but here's the thing. When culture shifts, God doesn't shift. I said when culture shifts, God never shifts. Like, like God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But we're seeing the result of when culture shifts away from God's ways. We're seeing the results of that, that Everything, and once again, I said it last week, I'm going to say it again, I'm going to say it every week. This is not a message to depress you. This is not a message to make you sad and leave here. Oh my God, we're, oh my, we're in such an ungodly world. No. This is our time to shine. This is our time to stand up. This is our time to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth and make a difference in an ungodly age. And, and, it's, and really, to be honest, we need to be excited during this time because it's always in the crazy times that God does his best work. Amen. That the church of Jesus, when things get, it's, I don't know, when grace, when sin abounds, much more grace abounds. So I, I'm almost, I'm like excited about it. I don't like seeing evil, but I'm saying I know that God is raising a standard. Whenever the enemy comes in like a flood, the Holy Spirit always rises a standard against him. So we are the people of God. So there's no reason to be afraid or discouraged or depressed or anxious because we're seeing our culture fall away from the ways of God. But we have a responsibility to be the light and be the salt and make a difference. So the thesis of the series is what do we do? What do, what do the people of God do when we see the culture shift more and more away from God? Like what do we do? What do we do when, you're, when your kids come home and they're like, you know what, I, my, my, you know, your, your child comes home, your daughter or son comes home and is like, my friend just became like thinks he's a uh, a girl today. Like, you know what I mean? Like, what do you do? And, and the series is tr basically to try to equip us of what to do. And if there's ever, there's a playbook, I believe, in the Bible 
uh, Daniel, most of you know the story. I explained it last week. Daniel uh, was in Israel. The Babylonians went to Israel, and they kept uh, the Israelites supernaturally blessed by God, supernatural. These are the children of God and, and all the covenants of God through Israel, God's chosen people. But they continued to rebel against the ways of God and God's principles, and, and God allowed the Babylonians or, or the enemy to come in and besiege the nation. And many times we're blaming God for things, and, and we're like, you know what? And, you know, sometimes people are like, why is God doing this? Why is God? No, you did it. <laughs> you, you did it. You, you got away from God's principles. You got away from God's ways. The country got away from God's ways, and you, you're opening the door to the enemy of your, in your life. Many times we're, we're living a, a result in our lives because of we're walking away from the Father's house. And anytime you walk away from the father's house, it always ends up, you always end up in a pig's pen. But here's the good news. We serve a good God, a faithful God, a merciful God, that he's always waiting on the porch for you to come home, you know. And someone give, someone, uh, give God thanks for that because he's already, always waiting for you to come home. He's always waiting for a country to come back, he's always waiting for his children to come back, and he's always accepting us. Amen. Amen. So, so we we've been we're studying Daniel because Daniel was taken with his with the nation, the Israelites, taken into captivity into an ungodly pagan culture, and if there's ever a playbook of how to live in an ungodly pagan culture. It's the book of Daniel. It's Daniel's life. It's so amazing. I explained it last week, and Daniel is, the, the book is mostly historical, and it's got some prophecy towards the end. The last few chapters is prophetic. The last few chapters, there's he was dreaming dreams, and he was seeing the end, and a lot of things already were fulfilled. The only things that Daniel has, he saw in his dreams, the only things that weren't fulfilled were the tribulation times. Like, that's the only really part that he, he, he prophesied so many things. I encourage you to go look at it because look at it because most of it has been fulfilled except the very end of days hasn't been fulfilled yet. And maybe we'll talk about that. We'll see where the Lord leads us in this series. But what's interesting is that this historical book uh, that has some prophecy in it is placed in the prophetic section of the Bible. And I said it last week. Why is that? Because I believe that the history becomes prophecy. So the history, what Daniel went through and the Israelites went through, would be a playbook for the generations to come. And that's why we're studying it now today, like what he went through and how Daniel lived in that ungodly. See, he, he served under three to possibly four empires over many years up until he was about 70 year, years old or so. And he served, it was about four empires, possibly three, and he never bowed once. He never bowed to the culture he was living in, but he wasn't a jerk about it. And that's the thesis of the series is that he never bowed, he stood firm, but he loved well and he even took it a step further. He had influence in his culture. And that's what I want for us is that, and last week we were in Daniel 6 because it's my favorite leadership verse is where it says he so distinguished himself, that he so distinguished himself, with, and then it says with excellent qualities that, and they could have killed them because he would not bow to their pagan ways. He would not bow at eating the king's food. We'll learn about that more today. He did not bow, and usually they would kill you for not bowing. But they said, you know what, there's something special about this guy. And he had influence in his culture. And all the kings that he served under ended up serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because he so distinguished himself and had influence in his culture. He didn't bow. But here's the thing. Most people think, and we talked about last week, grace and truth. Because grace is like, we love you, we accept you, like, God loves you unconditionally. Grace accepts us to be free. But then it's the truth, knowing the truth, that sets us free. Amen? 
And I talked about the extremes of the grace and the extremes of the truth that are both ineffective. That if we have this balance, grace and truth, that we can have influence in this ungodly age. Amen? Amen. Well, who's ready for part two? I'm ready to move on. You ready? So, so we're going to talk today about three marks of an ungodly shifting culture. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to read, starting from verse 1. It says, Daniel 1, 1 to 6. And then we're going to get, and then the, the main part, we're going to spend time in 7 today. But uh, verse 7. But uh, I'm going to read. Are you ready? In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, I think I'm saying that right, of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, that's the king of Judah, king of Israel, into his hand, along with some of the articles of the temple of God. So they stole even the church stuff. They stole the Ark of the Covenant, all the furnitures. They stole everything, which is a mockery of God. That's a totally mockery, total mockery of God. It goes on to say, these he carried off to the temple of his little G God in Babylonia and put in the treasure, put in the treasure the house of his God. Then the king uh, ordered Ashpenaz, he was a governor, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family, nobility, young men without physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. So they're recruiting the, the young ones, the intelligent ones, the, the handsome ones. So Pastor Mike would have been taken, you know. So, so but, uh, <laughs> and then this is what they would do. Get this, get this. So he was to teach them the language And literature. In other words, they would indoctrinate them. Indoctrinate them. They would give them books, new thinking, new rules, new ways to indoctrinate them to get them out of the ways of God and into the Babylon ungodly culture. The king assigned them a daily amount of food, which would be food that would break their kosher laws of the day, that they would break those laws Um, wine from the king's table. They were to be trained or indoctrinated for three years. And after that, they were to enter the king's service. So I'm thinking of the college girls here that in Jesus' name, you will not be indoctrinated and you will not be, you will not take on that culture in Jesus' name. And I'm not saying every college is evil, but there's something going on with the colleges today that they're, I mean, parents are sending their college, their their kids to colleges today, and they're coming back gone woke, gone crazy, gone, I mean, thinking like not, I mean, I'm not going to get into everything, but, but so that's not happening to our girls, right? That's not happening to our people in Jesus' name, because you got the spirit of the living God on you, and you know the truth. So they would be trained for three years, and after that, they, uh, they, they would be used for the king's service. And those, and here's where we're going to spend some time with, is among those were chosen some of the, some from Judah. This is Daniel. These are the main characters of the book. Daniel, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. So those last three names are unfamiliar to us because those are their Hebrew names. Most of you would know them as Meshach, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Thank you. I, I promise I can preach. But um, so it goes on to say, so, so, so here's the three marks of a, I'm going to give you three marks of a shifting culture. So verse seven, it says the chief official, get this, the chief official gave them new identities, gave them new names. Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, uh, Hananiah, Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. So a shifting culture culture will always try to change your identity. So in a spe, um, it's still even true today, but especially Hebrew culture back then, they were not just named like Anthony because the mother liked the name Anthony. Their name was tied to their purpose. Their name was a tie. It was it was very important. Their name basically would would say who they are and what, who, who God is calling them to be. So in these days, it was customary for the enemy 
to change, if they took somebody captive, they would t- change their name, to literally change their identity. And, and this is like in a, a complete mockery of how, of what God would call them and make them to be. And it's kind of crazy because this happened thousands of years ago and it's happening, it's happening today. So I'm going to show you their name. So Daniel, his name was, his, the meaning of his name is God is my judge. God is, so I'm living a life. God is my judge. I'm living a life submitted to God. I'm living a life that, I, like, you're my judge. You're my way. You're, I'm living according to your word. And they changed his name to Belteshazzar, which is lady, protect the king. So they gave him a girl's name. So there was, gen, you thought gender reassignment was just happening now. This has, like, been going on for thousands of years. Gender reassign or gender confusion, that that confused, redefined identity of who you are, and and this is and this is a spirit that's alive today. The spirit of Babylon. It's not just a locality in Iraq. It's a mentality and it's a spirit that will try to change your identity away from who God is calling you to be. And then the next one is Hananiah which means Yahweh has been gracious. In other words, God is good. God is gracious. Like my view of God is that he's a good God, right? And then it, the Shadrach means I'm fearful of God. Now that's not the reverential healthy fear of God. This is like I'm afraid of God. I don't like God. uh, uh, Like this is a redefined spirituality of your outlook and view of who God is. And if the devil can get you to think that God is not good, that every evil thing comes from him, it'll mess you up. Like it's so important, our view of who God is. So you got redefined gender and redefined spirituality of our view of who God is. And it's happening today, like, oh, God is not for you, God is mean, God is ugly, God is, he's causing this, God brought the coronavirus, God, why did God, all these kind of things, and it's just not true. And then the next one, oh, so Shadrach, I'm sorry, Mishael, I love this one, I love this, Mishael means who is what God is, like, like, like in, I love the, the innocence of this. The, the confidence is, is basically saying there's nobody like my God. There's nobody as powerful as my God. There's nobody as good as him. Like, who is like my God? And they changed his name to Meshach. So he had this confidence, and they changed his name to Meshach. I'm despised, contemptible, and humiliated. Do you see that? So in other words, he's gone from this confidence of like, how great is my God, to this depressed, I'm anxious, I'm fearful, to this stinking thinking of who I am, like taking away my understanding of who I am in Christ. I remember when we were at Teen Challenge, one of the things that we had to do for the first teen, if you don't know what Teen Challenge is, it's a Christian program that helps people that struggle with addiction. And we were there for, uh, I was there for three years, Pastor Mike was there for four or five years, and, and, and the first four or five months, what we would have to do is remind them who they are now. Like, who are you now that you're in Christ? Like, AA has helped a lot of people, and I'm not going to beat up AA today, but I reject the thought that I'm going to stand up today, and my name is Anthony, and I'm an alcoholic. No, 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 no. My name is Anthony, and I'm a child of God. My name, my name is Anthony, and I'm a new creation in Christ. My name is Anthony, and I've been changed, you know? My name is Anthony, and I, and I am called by God. I have been born again. I am a child of the Most High God. Come on, somebody. Like, so I'm not going to, The Bible, Romans 6 says to reckon yourself dead to sin. So I'm not, no longer a drug addict. I'm no longer an alcoholic. I am the righteousness of God in him. I am, oh, come on, somebody. I, I want to teach here. You're going to make me. Y'all are going to make me go preach. (laughs) I will in a minute, all right? I'll get there. But let me teach this first for a few moments. (laughs) 
getting me fired up, she, shouting me down up here. But, but Azariah, Azariah is Yahweh has helped. I love that. So God is my helper. Like he, like my God, God, that's where my help comes from, from God, right? They changed his name to Abednego, which is servant of Nebo. Now, you got to do a little digging to figure out what that is. And uh, Nebo is a Babylonian god of wisdom. It's a false god, a false god idol that, and, and, and so, so now I'm not a servant of God. I'm a servant of this false God. And that's what they are trying to do to get you to serve a false God. But these Hebrew boys, can I, can I give you the good news? These Hebrew boys refuse to bow. Someone say amen. So if you're taking notes, when culture shifts, we must know who we are. Because culture will try to change your identity. Culture will try to, try, uh, try to change of who you know, like, or, uh, of who you are in Christ. Like, like, will try to change your identity in Christ, what God made you to be, or how God made you, your view of God. Can I tell you today that you were made by Almighty God. He made you, some of you a man, man, he made you a woman. He made you exactly the way you are, and he didn't make any mistakes. He created your gender. He created your life. And he made you when you received Christ. By his blood, you've been made the righteousness of God in him. That by your blood, by his blood, you are forgiven. That you are redeemed. That, that you are restored. That you are God's chosen special people. That you are a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. That you're his own special people. That you are a child of the Most High God. That you are loved by God, that you are called by God, that you have purpose in God, that you, for I know the plans that he has for you, plans to prosper you, to give you a hope and give you a future. He said that he will, lo, I will be with you always, even till the end of the age. Don't get it twisted. For he said that, he said that I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So be strong and be be courageous. Come on, somebody, that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That no matter what culture throws at you, that I am a child of the Most High God, that I have decided that I'm going to follow Jesus all the days of my life. And I know that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I am more than a conqueror through him who loves me. That I am an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. I know who I am. I'm not my feelings, right? Ooh, someone. I, I found this. I love this. Isaiah 43, 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overtake you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Someone say Amen. Jeremiah 1.5, it says, before I formed you, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were even born, I set you apart. That's why we're pro-life, because a person is not a person out of the womb. A person is a person in the womb. Someone's, uh, a couple more better say amen. <clears throat> so God has a plan for your life. God has a purpose for your life. And it's not until you connect with God and is when you will discover that plan for your life. And that's why if you've been here for five minutes, you know one of the hallmark um, parts of this church is growth track. It's not just some system or thing that you go th through. I mean, growth track has three major parts here. Number one has helped you connect to the church. That if you, we give you as much information as you can possibly get. If you want to be a member or part of the family of this church, we give you that opportunity. We go over vision, mission, values. But part two is to help you discover who you are. Because it's not till you discover who you are until you can find God's purpose for your life. And part of that is that we give you every first, every first Sunday of the month, we do it. We run growth track. 
And uh, it helps you, part two, it helps you discover through a spiritual gifting assessment or a personality profile and a spiritual gifting assessment, it points to your destiny and your destiny points to your purpose. And everybody here has a purpose and it's not until you find that purpose that your life won't even make sense. So let's continue to the text. Back to verse 5 real quick. Verse 5 says, The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. So once again, that would be going against their dietary laws, right? And verse 8, it says, But Daniel, he was resolute. That was the word all week I was hearing. He was resolute. He resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And get, watch how polite he is. He wasn't a jerk about it. Because most people think that if I'm going to stand up for my ways, i got to be a jerk about it, and you don't. Because Daniel was respectful. It says he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself. He's like, excuse me, sir. Like, I don't want to eat this food. It goes against what I believe. Do you, can I have your permission? And if he didn't get permission, he'd be like, well, I ain't doing it anyway. But he, actually, he was actually respectful, you know. So, so he fought for his values, and he noticed, he noticed, you know, I noticed that he was very respectful. And that leads me to my second point, is that culture will always co- try to get you to compromise your standards. Yeah. Now, I personally, I'm not saying thus saith the Lord, uh, but I personally believe that this will happen on the rise. That culture will try to get you to compromise your values more and more, and it's happening that you'll get canceled if you don't. So this is already happening. Now, I don't know where all of this is going to go, but this is what I do know, is that y'all better make up your mind now. Like, you make up your mind now. Like, this is my values. These are my standards. This is what I believe. I'm living my life according to what God's word says. And I don't know where this has taken us. And I don't know if we'll ever face it to the, extre- uh, to the extreme of what they did in the biblical days or what people are around the world. But it's better you make up your mind now and say, you know what? I have decided that I'm going to live my life according to God's word. And I'm not going to compromise that. I'm not going to compromise my family's values. I'm not going to compromise my church's values. And as your pastor, this is what I'll promise you, is that I will not compromise God's word. I don't care what the laws say. I don't care if it goes against God's word. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I make you that promise before God from the pulpit. I didn't plan on doing that, but I feel like I need to do it today, that I will not compromise God's word because culture is shifting. So, but here's the thing. We're not going to be a jerk to people that are confused. We're not going to be mean to people. We're going to love well, but we're going to stand firm at the same time. Because if people are, we got to reach people that are confused. We have to leave the light on. We need to leave the door open. All walks of life are welcome here. And we need to love well. Daniel loved well. Amen. Someone say amen. So, so I was thinking of, the, of this today is that we can't set our standards according to what culture says. We need to set our standards to what God's word says. Because God, he always, so if my feelings or my, the way I feel like, like is leading me to something against God's word, I'm not going to change my, I'm not going to change my lifestyle according to the way I feel we change our lifestyle according to God's word. God's when God when you read God's word and it's showing you something that's not in your life or contrary to the way you are, you are living, you don't change you don't change God's words to appeal to your lifestyle. You change your lifestyle to appeal to God's word because God always calls us to repentance. Every time I read the Bible, almost I'm like, I gotta get better there. That's called repentance. Like He doesn't condemn you. But when culture shifts, we must know what we believe. We must know what we believe. So the truth, a bedrock doctrine here, the truth comes from God's word. 
So it's not government. It's not, it's not what's new in the culture. It's not how I feel. It's not what's popular. It's not what's happening in Hollywood. The truth comes in God's word. And it's, it's a resolute that I've made up my mind, that I've decided that this is where I stand. That as a church and as a people, that I'm not going to change my mind. That I'm not shifting. That I, that I've, I love what Joshua said. He, Joshua said in Joshua 24, 14 and 15, he goes, Now fear the Lord. Now that's the healthy fear. The, the, I love the way John Bevere explains the fear of the Lord, the healthy fear of the Lord. He calls it the awe of God. So, so in other words, I, the fear of the Lord is like I'm in awe of God. Like, wow. Like that's the reverential fear, right? And serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of, an, of your ancestors who worship uh, beyond the Euphrates River in Egypt and, and serve the Lord. And he goes on to say, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable for you, choose for yourselves this day whom you're going to serve, whether the God of your ancestors beyond the Euphrates, the God of the Amorites, in the land which you used to you were living. But as for me in my house, but as for me, as for me in my house, as for me in my church, as for me and my wife, as for me and my children. We're going to serve the Lord Jesus. Someone say amen. I don't care who you're serving. You know what? I have decided I'm going to serve the Lord Jesus. Amen. So I love that resolute statement that I don't care how ungodly and crazy the things get. I'm not bowing. That we will serve Jesus all the days of our lives. Are you ready for that? Do you mean it? Back to the text in Daniel 1, verse 9, it says, Now God caused the official to show favor. Remember, he was getting them to try to eat the food. And um, he caused the official to show favor to sim- uh, favor and sympathy to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my little lowercase l, Lord, lowercase k, king, who has assigned your food and drink. He was afraid. He's like, why should he see you looking worse than the other men? He's like, he's going to have my head because of you. If you're falling apart and you're not eating the right food, I'm going to lose my head. So Daniel said to the guard, whom the chief official appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, just put us to the test. He said, please test your servants for 10 days. By the way, 10 always represents test. In your Bible. So many times, I don't have time to go through, but 10 represents test. He said, give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who are eating the royal food and treat. In other words, see if your way works and we'll see if our way works and then be the judge of it. Like, we're going to be okay. Like, you know what? And you can fill in the blank with that. Like, I love when people decide, not I don't love it, but it's like I don't fight with people or debate with people or get mad at people like that walk away from God. I pray for them, and I'm like, my goodness, like like the ways of God. As a pastor, I have to counsel things to people that confront lifestyles, and sometimes they end up, they, they, sometimes they submit and they say, you know what? You're right, pastor, I'm going to change it, and they do it, and it's amazing. And some people leave the church. And because I'm I'm accountable as a pastor for for the way, what what I see. If If I see you in an ungodly, sinful lifestyle and just don't say anything to you, I'm accountable before God. So as much as it might hurt your feelings or whatever, I'm accountable before God. And we've seen people... Several people leave the church, and I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to get, like, so freaked out by it because your life is going to, it's going to, you're going to see the result of it. Like, like you're, like, if you're going to live the ungodly lifestyle, it always leads you to craziness and chaos and ungodliness and confusion, and, and it always does. So, but what I like to do is to leave the light on. Hey, listen, when you decide to make your decision and realize that you're making the wrong one, like, like I'm not going to be a jerk about it, but hey, you're always welcome to come back here. You're always welcome. We accept you. You don't have to leave now even if you don't make the decision. 
But, but so many people have, I've noticed that as a pastor. I'm, I'm blown away. I'm blown away that people, if you just say, hey, listen, I love you, but this is ungodly lifestyle. And people are like, who are you? Talk to me. And they end up leaving. I'm just blown away. But, um, but just leave the light on. They'll be back. Amen? So he it goes on to say, goes on to say, so he agreed and, and tested them for 10 days. So this is the food test, right, for Daniel. He would go on to be tested in so many different ways, like way more serious, like thrown into the lion's den, you know, thrown into the fire. I mean, the brother would be tested. And, um, and that leads me, I have to say this point, if I'm going to be a pastor, and, and I, I got to be honest with you, is that culture is going to test your faith. Culture will test your faith. And I've had my own test. I remember in, you know, bef- you know, when we started the church, actually, I always look at my wife and she's not there. But uh, I'm, I'm still not used to her in the children's church. But when we started the church, we, oh, oh she's here. What are you doing back there? She's hiding in the back row? Get up here. No, I'm joking. But when we started the church, we were, I remember we were so excited and we were nervous, but excited and fired up and getting ready to rock this region for Jesus, you know? And, and we thought that everyone was going to be happy and excited for us. And to be honest, we got persecuted pretty badly. And we were shocked because we, I don't think one atheist came against us. It was the religious people. And, and it, was, it was very strange. Like, I, I was like, this is really weird. Like, why are the church folk coming against us? Like, we thought that they would come. I, I remember, like, when I served under Pastor Damola, he was so excited when God would use people to, to start a work. He would bless them. And and we were getting the opposite. I, like, it was crazy, like, getting on, on social media, people. I don't know if they were threatened or something, but it was crazy. And those are some of our tests. And, 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 and then when we, you know, when, in 2020, we all had our own craziness when we went on through, um, through the pandemic. And 2021 was hard. Per, we had personal, like, I mean, the devil which tried to really to see if we were for real to try to get us to quit and came. I, one day I'll share. I was thinking about it this week, and I, we're not ready to share some of the things that we went through. But one day we will. But can I tell you right now that the things that we went through are nothing like what the people of the Bible, the Bible days went through. Like I, every time I'm like, oh, man, boo-hoo me. This is getting really hard. And I'm like, I don't know if I can keep doing this anymore. I remember like they were, their, their tests were floggings, imprisonment, and death, and being sawn in two. And I'm like, all right, I better man up and move forward. Amen. <laughs> boo-hoo me. Boo-hoo me. But, but, I don't, but, you know, I don't know where all this is going, but we need to be ready. But, you know, and, and there's people right now around the world that are being tested for their faith that are hiding in churches because if they get caught, they'll get killed. Can we just take a moment and thank God for our country that we do, even though it's getting, it is shifting a little bit, a lot of bit, we still live in the best country in the world. Can we take a moment and thank God for the freedoms of our nation? But even here, you will be tested. You will be tested. And here, I'm going to finish with this, is that when culture shifts, we must stand firm. So I found that word stand. So I was looking for scriptures in the New Testament that would have this word stand. So the words, the, 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 the three points that I have are right from the scriptures. Are you ready? Before I get into it, I want to share this one I found in 1 Corinthians 16, 13 to 14. It says, be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, but do everything in love. So, so, so the whole world doesn't have to hate you because you're standing firm, but you need to stand firm so we can have influence. Amen? But the, the first one I want to talk about is to stand in prayer. To stand in prayer. That if I'm going to stand against the devil of the culture, I better have God's presence on my life. 
And prayer is not just communion with God. Prayer is confronting our enemy. So you need to remember that I'm not, it's not just kumbaya, spend the time with God. You better t- take some time binding the enemy over your family, binding the enemy that is trying to come against your kids, binding the devil that's trying to come against your workplace, binding the devil. You know what I mean? Like you need to spend some time in spiritual warfare. Not for four hours, but it could be for 15 minutes to bind the enemy that's trying to... And remember, the major weapons against our spiritual enemy is the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, the word of God. He is freaked out by the blood. Just say, the blood of Jesus is against you. Hands off of my children. The blood is against you. The cross is against you. The cross was the ultimate defeat of the devil when he's trying to bring condemnation against you. Remind them of the cross of Jesus that he has disarmed the principalities, and he made a public spectacle over, over them, triumphing over them. Someone say amen to that, that we have been forgiven by the blood, by the cross. Thank you for the cross, and the word of God is the sword of the spirit. So remember to engage in warfare. And I, and I always say this, that prayer should not be our last resort, but it should be our first response that I try to remind myself like when I'm about to get into a meeting or I'm, my phone rings and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is Sister Sandpaper about to call me. Like, and I, I'm like, you, you guys have that Sister Sandpaper in your life, you know what I mean? And that phone rings and it's like, oh Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, I invite you into that call. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, you know, like invite God into every part of your life, like before that meeting at work, before that meeting at school, before that appointment, before that interview. It, you know, there's power in the short prayers. Like short, you don't have to like intercede for four hours before that job. You know what? Like you, so you don't have time and you're at work, but you know what, God, I need you right now. I'm about to make this phone call to this client. I need you. I invite you into this call in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello. You know, like, like that's what that looks like, the power of short prayers. And remember the culture you're coming against or the job that what's going on in your job or what's going on in your family. It's not your war is not against people. It's a spirit. So I better bind the spirit that is trying to hold this person back. Now, we're not a devil behind every bush kind of people, but there is a devil, and he is real, and he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. So, oh, come on, somebody. Ephesians 6, put on the full arm of God so that you take your stand against the devil's schemes, for our struggle is not against people, flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, these are demonic spirits. Well, I don't believe in the devil. Well, that doesn't mean he's not real. He is real. He is real. Against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of the evil and heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, Stand. It's that, right? Come on, somebody. These are the, this is what the Bible says. Stand firm. Amen? So if you're taking notes today, p- put this one on Facebook or, or, or twi- twat or Twitter or whatever. Twat it. Daniela, twat it, right? So, so I believe that courage, courage in culture comes in prayer. I don't know what it is. When I spend time with God in prayer, I come out of that prayer closet ready to go bear hunting with a switchblade, amen? Like, I, I come, I got this renewed confidence. I'm, like, fired up, like, because I spent time with Almighty God. God's presence is on my life. I wake up in the morning just like you. Sometimes I wake up in the morning, I'm discouraged, and I'm like, oh, you know what? I don't even want to do this anymore. And then God reminds me, you know what? You better stand, and you better get tough, and you better pray, and the presence of God comes on my life, and then I push forward, and I'm ready to fight devils. Come on, somebody. I'm joking. One woman said, you know, I got the devil on my gas tank. I'm like, really? The devil's on your gas tank? Like, what do you mean? I ran out of gas again. I'm like, well, did you put gas in the car? No. 
What? There's no devil on your gas tank. You know what I mean? So we're not being hyper-spiritual, but there is a devil assigned against your life. The moment you got saved, there's been a devil trying to stop you from getting into your assignment in God. Because all of you have purpose in God, and the, and the devil knows oh, you're going to heaven, and he can't take that away from you. But what he wants to take from you is your purpose in God, because he can't take your salvation from you, but he doesn't want you to bring anyone to heaven with you. Oh, I'm, I'm just going to. The second place in Scripture, it says, it says, stand for the work of the Lord. In other words, stand for your assignment. Stand for the assignment. This is big. Stand for the assignment that God has given me because the devil will always attack where you're called. Because so there's days that I'm like, you know what, I want, I'm, I'm discouraged, I want to quit, but I remember my assignment. That we all have assignment. Assignment. And this, I gotta be honest, when you discover your assignment, this is where the life of God comes in you. This is when, this is when like grace comes on your life. When you discover why you were created, you discover why God created you, like you discover your assignment, the life of God comes again, comes on you. And, and this is why the, the, I was thinking of the scripture that where there is no vision, my people perish. You guys know that scripture. I think the NIV says that where there is no vision, they cast off restraint. In other words, like, it doesn't matter. It, do, it doesn't matter. Like, if I don't have a vision, if I don't have assignment, we have, listen, I need you to listen to me because there's a distraction in the room right now. People are moving around, and this is, this is important because I'm telling you right now that if you don't have an assignment or a vision from God for your, li- for your life, our human beings have a tendency of taking the path of least resistance. We all do. But if you know that I am called for this assignment, and you remember, God called me to this. And when the enemy tries to bring, don't be shocked when the enemy brings resistance against your life. The resistance will come, but I know I have vision. I have assignment. I will not quit because I know what God has called me to do. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. There's so much more I wanted to say about that, but that's okay. It goes on further. Here's the scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give, give yourselves fully to the assignment that God gave you, the work of the Lord, because you know the, your labor is not in vain. Say, say amen. amen. And then number three, and we're going to close with this, and we can play the keys to make it sound better. We're going to close with this is that number three is we're going to stand for God. We're going to stand for God. Because I think there's this one side of thing that God loves me, God loves me, God loves me, and God stands for me, and God is for me, and who can be against me, and all that stuff, and all of it's true, but I think God is looking for a people that is going to stand for him. Like, I'm going to stand for the honor of my God. How much would he love it if you stood for him? at your workplace when people are saying GD, GD, GD. And you say, hey, you know what? If you're going to say that, maybe say it right. Say, say the devil because God doesn't damn anything. At least say it right, you know? Whoever acknowledges me before others, Jesus said, I will acknowledge them before my Father in heaven. So I'm unashamed to represent a kingdom that is unshakable. I am unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am unashamed to pray at, at the restaurant. The waiter's going to have to wait a minute until I'm done praying. I'm, unash- I'm not embarrassed to, sh- to pray. I'm not embarrassed of my God because I'm representing Jesus. I love Matthew 10. Matthew 10.32 in the Message uh, Bible. It's not a translation. It's a paraphrase. It says, stand, stand for me against the world opinion, and I'll stand for you, but I, and I'll stand up for you before my Father in heaven. Amen. So I was thinking of this song. I was actually going to ask Melissa to sing it, and I forgot. But um, you know the song that I have decided to follow Jesus. 
I have decided okay. to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. The world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. Come on, give yourselves a round of applause. So I don't know if you know where that song came from. Came from a guy's name, Asum, Asum from India, who converted to Christianity. And he was brought, because he converted to Christianity, he was brought before the chief of his village. And they were getting ready to execute him. And they were telling him, you need to deny Jesus or you're going to die. And he says, I'm sorry, but I have decided to follow Jesus. And I'm not turning back. So the chief at that moment killed his wife. And they said, and he said, well, what now, sir? He goes, are you sure you still, you don't want to deny Jesus? How about now? And he, go, and he said this, though none go with me, still I will follow. This is, he said, this is your last chance. This is your last chance. And he goes on to say, the cross is before me and the world is behind me. And they cut off his head. He made a decision that I will follow Jesus no matter what. No turning back, no turning back. You know, the chief was so inspired that he gave his life to Jesus. The whole village got saved because of the, because of the courage of this guy to stand up and say, you know what? To live is Christ, as Paul said, to die is gain. I wanted to close with this. Everywhere in the New Testament, uh, several places in the New Testament, it says that Jesus is sitting. So after Jesus would come, born of a virgin Mary, walk three and a, 33 and a half years, perfect sinless life, would die on an old rugged cross for the sins of humanity. He would die and raise from the dead three days later. 40 days later, he would ascend to the right hand of the Father and sit. Several places says he is seated at the right hand of the Father. Well, so here's one place, Colossians 1, it says, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Hebrews says that he's seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us, the saints, right? Well, there's, in every place it says that he's seated, except one place. One place. I'm going to read it in Acts chapter 7. A Christ, the first Christian martyr, Stephen, he stood boldly for his faith and they stoned him to death. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus at that time, would oversee the killing of the deacon, Stephen. You can read this in Acts chapter 7 in your own time. But here it is, the, uh, verse 50, Acts 7, verse 55. It says, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven, so he saw an open vision of heaven, and he saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing at the, oh, come on, somebody. He saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He said, look, he said, I see heaven. I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Mm. So I, I picture it like this, like the God, the, there's God the Father, and he's watching what, what Stephen is doing, standing up for his faith, and he says, hey, son, Jesus, look at, look at our servant, look at our servant Stephen. And Jesus at that moment stood. 
Because can I tell you the thought right here is that when you stand for God, Jesus stands for you. Somebody shout amen. When I stand for Jesus, Jesus stands for me. Wow, there's there's such an anointing right now on this right now. Everyone just bow your head. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus for courage for your people. God, I pray for strength. God, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice. We don't know where this is all going. We don't know where all this is all going, but God, I pray for courage. I pray, God, that you would bless your people. God, I pray that you would bring divine influence upon their lives, that they would go out of these four walls and influence this culture. And God, I pray that your presence would be so increased upon their lives, God, that your hand would be upon their lives and that you would keep them from the evil one. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed, I want to ask you today, if you're here today, your first step, maybe some of you are here today, your first step is to say, you know what? I need to stand for Jesus right now and make a decision. I need to make a decision before I leave here today that I want to say, like the Indian guy, that I have decided to follow Jesus. I want to give you that opportunity with every head bowed, every eye closed. If I'm speaking to you, maybe you need to make a rededication or maybe it's a decision for the first time. And anyone that's watching online, this is for you too. Anyone that will ever watch this, you can make this decision right at home. You don't have to be in church. You don't have to be in a house of God. You can be anywhere on the planet and make a decision that I have decided to follow Jesus. And I'm going to repeat that scripture in Matthew where Jesus said that if you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. I want to give you that opportunity today by just simply raising your hand and saying, you know what, I want to make a decision for Christ today. That I want to leave here today and say, I have decided to follow Jesus and the blood of Jesus will wash you and cleanse you of all of your sin. All you got to do is say yes. So if you want to make that decision here today, I want to lead you in a very simple prayer of faith. Just simply raise your hand amongst all your brothers and sisters in Christ here today. Just raise your hand. Be bold. I see hands up. I see hands up. I see hands up. You may put your hand down. Say, just repeat after me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of the living God. Here today, I have decided that I want to follow you all the days of my life. I confess you as my Lord. I believe you died for me and rose from the dead. I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me of all of my sin. Holy Spirit, fill me. Light a fire from within me. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. At this time, I want to ask the prayer team to please come up. If you're here and you need prayer for healing, spirit, soul, body, marriage, whatever it is, we have anointed intercessors and prayer warriors that will agree with you and pray with you. If not, I want to bless you as you go. If you want to just if you feel comfortable to raise your hand, Father, I bless your people. God, I bless them as they go in Jesus' name. God, I pray that the fire of God would be upon their lives in greater measure. I pray a protection over them. May your face shine upon them, God. May you give them peace in Jesus' name. And I declare that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. And any demonic curse that would try to come against their life would be broken because the devil cannot curse what God has blessed. In Jesus' name, and all God's people, say amen. 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 God bless you. We love you. Have an amazing week. Take care.